Hey everybody, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are virtually um, or in this room. So uh, today we're going to get into a little bit more about the performance schema. Um, so first of all, just a couple orders of business. We're going to be covering uh, diagnosing database issues with MySQL 8.0's performance schema and some, some new ads in that direction. Um, my name is not Andrew Morgan. <laughs> So more on that in a second. But let's start off with some important stuff. Um, actually, first, first one to answer this will win a prize, OK? So who can tell me which cloud provider performs best for MySQL workload? Nobody? Yeah. Which one? None. None? <laughs> OK, I like that answer. So which, which hat did you get? When, you got that one? Do you want the tiger or the unicorn? The unicorn? OK. Unicorn it is. So in the real answer, the right answer, is whichever cloud provider you're talking to. Oh, sorry about that. You were right. I can't throw them. <laughs> My colleague's like, you're not even going to make it five feet. And I'm like, well, that was about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that nine. OK. So um, real quick, just a poll. This is not for a prize, so don't get too worked up. Um, how many people don't have any workload in the cloud? Wow, that's about, what's that? I don't count that. I mean more of one of the cloud providers. Internal clouds, I get. Yeah, private clouds. Um, so that's about half the room. Interesting. Um, how many have some workload in the cloud? OK, a couple. Uh, how about all your workload in the cloud? OK, kind of step down on that. That's interesting. OK, some free marketing data there for me. Um, so real quick, go ahead and shout out, what cloud platforms are you guys using, the ones that are leveraging cloud primarily? AWS, raise your hand. Azure. <laughs> Uh, GCP? OK. Other? Any other? OK. Nice. OK. Very cool. Thank you for that input. Um, so for the agenda today, some things we're going to talk about. Uh, first of all, my favorite topic, me, right? Um, what do we care about when it comes to database performance and tuning and things like that? We're going to do a real quick refresher. Um, the performance scheme has been around in MySQL for quite some time now. So, but we're going to cover some of the basics, just to make sure we're all on the same page, stuff like that. And then we're going to look at some new columns that got added to some of the existing tables. And we're also going to look at some new tables that got added with 8.0, right? So, so some new, new good stuff. And then finally, actually, what do we do with this data? Why do we care about it? Why should we care about it? Why is it important? You know, what, what kind of intel can we glean from this, this new data? OK, so Andrew Morgan, he was the one that was supposed to be delivering this. So this is him. This is not me. <laughs> um, I'm actually a colleague of Andrew Morgan's. And uh, he sends his sincerest regards, but he got stuck at Coachella and is still there. I know, since April, right? But he said he was going to get to Austin pretty soon, right in time for Austin City Limits. So don't know what that's about. But um, he'll be here shortly. Uh, actually, my name is Rob Mandeville. And I can also spell databases. So I offered to go ahead and give this talk for him and cover his content. So if you don't like this presentation, you can spell my name M-O-R-G-A-N. If you do like it, you can spell it M-A. No, just kidding. OK, so what do we care about? What do we care about? OK, so first of all, users care about their own experience, right? We're all kind of selfish. I'm selfish. Everybody's a little selfish. Some people are totally self-absorbed, looking this way. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, but really, at the end of the day, the best way to say this is, so whoever, pick a name. Susan in accounting, 
Like, does she really care if CPU's at 90% or that you have high disk latency or that memory's, you know, kind of pegged and, and swapping? Probably not, right? She just wants her reports to run quickly so that she can go to lunch on time. So that's really what this is about. Users care about their own experience. However, kind of taking that, flipping that back to the IT operational side, you know, these service managers, they do care. They care about the cost. They care about the utilization. They care about kicking into that next tier or potentially throwing more money at a situation to make sure that they can maintain a quality of service, right, from the data layer. So that's where it becomes important to the, the service manager anyway. And also the importance of making sure that we're optimizing our workload and not necessarily just throwing dollars at it. So to sum up, do we really care about our end users? Eh, <laughs> maybe, right? Um, but they care about themselves so, you know, this is, this is like us doing them a favor to learn a little bit more about the performance of our subsystems, of our databases, and uh, to get them to love you guys. So, that's what this is about. Okay, what do we care about? Um, response time, response time, response, like we, we hear a lot about this, right? You guys probably hear it daily, weekly, whatever hourly, who knows. Um, kind of sick of it, maybe, but it really does matter, right? It's probably one of the only things that matter in the end is what's our response time. Um, part of that goes into the, the error rates, but we'll get into that in just a second. Um, but yeah, we do also have errors, but, but for the most part, errors tend to be easy, meaning there's usually a cause for an error, right? We know a cause, we get a message, we get a log file, things like that. When we say things are slow or performance is suffering, that's written to a log sometimes, especially like slow queries and stuff like that. But that's more of a duration thing, right? So we have to be careful about how we interpret that. We might just be asking for a ton of work to be done. Um, and actually, it was, it was kind of funny. When I was first looking at this slide, I was like, I think Andrew made a mistake. Like, did he just cut and paste and forget that it was the same, same text or whatever? And, and then I looked at it a little bit more and I'm like, oh wait, okay, end users care about the experience from response time and errors go into that. Quality of service also cares about response time, or at least should. Okay, we have some examples of database SLOs here. And these were just a couple that, that Andrew picked at random here, but so, so we can look at this latency, this response time, as you know, being able to satisfy a query or a SQL statement in a certain amount of time, right? So let's say less than 450 milliseconds, less than 900 milliseconds. And then we also have to define our SLO as how much of our workload is gonna be completed within that allotted time, within that, that latency or less. Um, so, these are a couple examples there, and you know, we're seems to me like we're a pretty impatient society. Like everybody wants stuff super fast. Nobody can wait a second. Um, but a great thing to understand here is is actually what's normal for your environment. Okay. So, and the reason I say that is that we as humans we we become pretty adjusted quickly to things that are bad, right? We don't like like I don't know a train is always late or whatever. We get used to that. So we show up late too. We just adjust to the bad things in our lives. Um, doesn't mean it's okay, but we do adjust to it. So first of all, starting out though, I would say definitely get to understand what your performance, eh, performance profile looks like within your company, within your organization, and then tune from there, right? Definitely get that baseline though. So please, 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 get rewarded for your hard work, but make sure you, you know where you're starting from. Okay. Oh, and another thing to point out here, um, what's that? Oh, <laughs> another thing to point out here is, is uh, you know, sometimes the, the amount of work we have to do 
just to squeeze a little more performance out of our systems can be significant. So at the end of the day, to get from you know, one SLA of like 95% at less than 450 milliseconds to just four percentage points better at 900 milliseconds or less, uh, you have to reduce the, the errors by like 10x, right? So the tolerances get, get ever increasingly tough to, to achieve. Okay, quick refresher on some of these summary tables. So we have this table, it's the event statement summary by digest table. Um, great summary table about execution stats and, and digested queries. Does anybody know what a digested query is? Somebody help me. Yeah. It's a query pattern, so you see where there's a big question mark there, and that's the digest code is just a hash of it. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Duck? Duck. <laughs> you can exchange it later, too. Oh, that throw is better. All right. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so really a digested query is, is more of a normalized form of that query. Strips out white space, strips out literals, right? So it aggregates queries into like queries. Um, so you can see here in this table, we get some, some cool stuff. First of all, we get the, uh, the digest text. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, but we also get a hash for that digest. So this is hopefully what's going to be a unique value based on some inputs. Um, real quick on that one, though. Has anybody run into a hash collision on a query digest? Extremely unlikely, based on the hash value, but. How would you know? How would you know? Yeah. Oh, different query text for the same query digest, hash. Is there not a, a unique index on digest on this table? I don't. I don't know if it would allow me to write this. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. OK, I'm going to put one, that one down for Andrew. <laughs> Actually, that was a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And again, you can exchange it if you already have the tiger. But it could solve for this problem. But this, I mean, the, the only reason I ask this is that it's hugely unlikely to occur in the first place based on the string that's output from the hash. But I guess theoretically it could happen. Un <clears throat> yeah, and you've never run into, OK, interesting. Do they all get digested to the same? Normalized query, or how does that look? OK, interesting. That's cool. I, I, and I love hearing kind of use cases like that, too, right? It's really interesting for me, personally. Um, yeah, we also get some other information here about uh, some other metadata, like the schema, the count star, the first scene, last scene, and then and then some of the summarizations of the columns uh, being affected by the digested or within the digested query, like some of rows affected, some of rows examined, uh, index usage or no index used. So this, this can really help us help to understand things about the digested query. Like, is the optimizer being efficient, right? So if the number of rows examined is just a ton more than the tons of rows that affected or desired by the query, then we know that there's inefficiencies involved somewhere, right? Could be because of a missing index, a lot of other reasons that that could actually occur. Um, oh, there was a note on here too, and I don't, I don't know if anybody needs to get to this level of detail, but I guess the, uh, the hash used to be an MD5 hash, now it's a SHA-256 in 8.0. Thought I'd throw that out there. Andrew thought he would throw that out there. <laughs> All right, here's an example of the DDL to go ahead and create this table. Um, I'll let you guys kind of wonder at its splendor a little bit here. Uh, but I, I, I do think the slides are going to be made available for everybody. So you don't have to take pictures unless you want me to slide over. And No. All right. Again, I think these will made these will be available to everyone, all the attendees. Perfect. And it's being recorded, so you can freeze right there. 
OK. Summary by digest. The, OK, completely awesome table. Um, but our summary by digest has a couple limitations. Uh, one of it is the table size, so the number of rows that you can keep. You can kind of affect this a little bit. You could either make the, the table size larger, um, or you could do some periodic deletes or truncation of the, the data. You know, those are, those are ways to kind of deal with that size. Um, I would say the size of the table that you want really depends on your workload, how much is getting recorded here, and also what your business requirements are, right? Because I'm going to talk in a minute about another table that is introduced new to the performance schema in 8.0. Um, and it's going to be joined or be able to be joined back to this table. So it depends on how much metadata you want about the performance and how far back you want to be able to go, right? So is it a day, a week, a month, something like that? So that's where this becomes important. But then also, how many individual digested queries you're actually recording, because that can fill up pretty fast, especially with hundreds of thousands of unique queries, or queries that get digested uniquely, I should say. Um, there was also this limitation on the digest text and the SQL text. So the, um, the limitation was 1024. Is that, is that still the case? I think it still is by default. So you may want to change that character limitation, though, because um, depending on the query size and how many characters are involved in the text, and again, this is kind of you guys understanding your own workload, but two queries could be, like, let's say the select clause is, like, huge, right? And there's another query just like it, but it's got, like, an additional join or something or a different predicate. So uh, those could actually be evaluated to the same query text even though they're different somewhere past 1024, right? So just be aware of that limitation. OK. Let's see. I think that's all the notes on that one. Um, oh, real quick, back on this one. Just, just to say that it might become important, if you guys are really going to leverage this, this information from the performance schema, to be able to for sure identify uniquely query text associated with the data, right? So if two do evaluate and they look to be the same, they could actually have different stats. So that's, that's where this really becomes important. OK, new stuff. Yay. New columns in the summary by digest table. So unfortunately, we're going to go back to math class a little bit. <laughs> and stats and probability. Uh, I know I for sure have your attention now, as I should. Um, so the new columns are the, the quantiles, right? So we've got, like, like, by default, the 95, the 99, and the 999. Um, so basically stating that, that for a given digest, 95% of the executions have a latency lower than the quantile of 95, right? Or, like, how many of those executions fall within that quantile. Like it's captures, should be captured about 95% of the workload, right? Um, and actually, these new columns really help if you guys are going to start leveraging this stuff to start to determine what is my current quality of service delivery that I'm meeting within my environment. In other words, how much of the workload is actually meeting an SLO? Right, so that can become kind of cool. And to, again, kind of capture this information before you start doing your tuning efforts, because we want you guys to get credit for what you're doing. OK, whoops. I think this one. So another new column is the sum of CPU time. This is really good to see which digested SQL Statements and text are, are consuming the most CPU cycles. Um, how many here actually have CPU as a limiting factor anymore? Pro rarely. So, rarely? OK. How many were on cloud compute? Because <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, 
But but it is kind of it's it. This becomes important if CPU becomes your limiting factor, right? You need to know which of those queries are actually consuming most of those CPU cycles, because that's going to kind of prioritize it for you guys. Which ones do I want to go tune, optimize? What do I tackle first, right? What's going to be the biggest ROI, basically, when tuning? Um, so one thing I'll mention here, and I've actually seen this. Uh, so in my current role, I get to work with a lot of different customers. I get to see their environments. I get to hear their pains, right? A lot of customers I've been working with, especially recently, have now migrated workload from on-prem to the cloud. And in doing so, they actually have run up to some, some uh, performance problems because of that. So after we collect the right information, after we go get the right data, we can then tell them, look, you're being throttled from the cloud provider because of the instance size you purchased, because of the storage you bought, because of the limitation of the IOPS and the throughput that came along with that storage, you're now slow, right? So it's really important to be able to understand, like, and especially if you guys are going to be going from on-prem to cloud anytime in the future or additional projects going on or something like that, to, to really understand what does my current performance profile look like if I can tune that before I get to the cloud, I might even be able to get away with smaller instance size, less resources. That means less money for the business, right? And we all know if you save the business money, that goes right in your pocket, right? Not really. OK, but if CPU does become a bottleneck, this is a great place to come and get some statistical information about which digested queries you should go after first. Those are great questions for Andrew. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have that information ready, but um, we'll, I tell you what, after this session, let, let me, let's exchange some information and we'll, we'll get that answer for you. Great question. I thought you already, oh, you got that one. Yeah, yeah, what kind of, what, yeah. You already, a duck? OK. Yep. Can I trade it for that hat? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I will. That's a deal. I'm already doing that, I think. But um, OK. So, so one thing to mention here is that even though we can buy new hardware, we can, we can increase core counts, we can buy chip architecture with higher clock speeds, right? we can throw money at the problem. We can buy bigger instances on our cloud provider. We can do all kinds of stuff like that. But this all costs money, right? So one of the key things and takeaways from this is let's make sure we're placing our bets wisely that where we're putting our money, it's actually going to go to the greatest benefit. Sometimes that will be hardware. Sometimes it will be tuning efforts. Sometimes it will be data model changes. Who knows, right? So anyway, um, so some other columns that got added to our summary by digest are these concepts of query samples. So one of the problems that I found with query digest, it's great to be able to see the aggregation of like queries against my database engine, right? The problem is I lost the visibility of the literals being thrown in via these queries. They get stripped out, right? The optimizer is going to treat. Oh, <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so some of, the, uh, some of the things that get lost are what the actual values are that are being submitted within these queries. So the query samples allow for the best of both worlds. You definitely don't want to capture every execution of every query that goes against your database, right? The overhead, the 
the hit to performance would just be, you, you can't take that kind of hit, right? You'd never get any work done. Um, but being able to sample periodically and grab the actual query text, including the literals being submitted, uh, can go a long way as far as understanding like the ebbs and flows of performance over time, right? And I'm thinking about some of these, some of these operators, these inequality operators like greater than or less than or something like that. Like if I do a select whatever, something from some table where ID less than 10, the, the, the performance for that is going to be way, way different than where ID less than 10 million, right? So sometimes the literals matter. And the sampling gets us there without crushing performance or adding too much overhead. OK. So we also have query sample seen. So this just marks the date timestamp of when that sample was collected. Pretty cool. So if you want to plot that over time, you can go back and get the data and kind of, kind of visualize that. And then the query sample timer weight. So does anybody know what this one is? Another chance for a hat. Not you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anybody? What does it say? Query sample timer weight. It's kind of a cryptic name. Actually, it's not. That would be more interesting, but then what if there's different weight types being experienced or, or weight event, you know? Yeah, exactly. thank you. Free plug, there we go. <laughs> You'll get a hat, I'll get you one. I just can't throw that far. Um, no, it's actually the, the, the duration of the sample. So how long did it take when the database engine got that query to the time that it, it, it was complete? That's it. So, but the interesting thing is, so the, the query sample text, and it, it, it does kind of come full circle though. So we get the information about the sample, like the literals being passed in. We get when this was taken, when the sample was, was uh, sampled, I guess, it's redundant. And then we also get the duration of the execution for that sample, right? Now the cool thing is, well, maybe cool, maybe not cool. That duration can change radically depending on what weight types are being experienced, right? If it's straight CPU cycles, straight processing, hey, you know, then, then we can account for the variabilities with the literals being put in there. If it's due to some kind of blocking or something like that, like another session has a lock on the resource and it needs to release it, that could be a huge amount of duration with like where ID equals one, equals one, right? So we can get some, some wild fluctuations depending on what's happening. Okay. The, uh, you mean enable or disable the sample collection? Yeah, so it, it depends on what you're looking at. I mean, this is all internal to your MySQL, so, so all the sensitive data is there already in your data set. This is just capturing the query that came in and still storing it within that same MySQL instance. So what you do with that data, what you expose it to, if you send it to the cloud, that's up to you, right? So, but the sampling is still held. We're not talking about tool sets here. We're not talking about anything. This doesn't leave this MySQL instance at this point. This is just captured by the performance schema in here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then that begs other quite, but that's more like product specific and what do we want to do with this data now that we can go after it? Okay. It feels like a bit of a cheat, but you could set it to like the length of one for the query digest. Oh. So it's just going to get like the first character or something like that? Like, yeah. like nothing. Like global, anyway, you wouldn't be able to collect it from any other schema within the server. Oh. You said to yourself, well, let the system run with it while disabling it. It's like super chunky. I mean, one thing I'm aware of is that there are some products out there that allow you to set a configuration file. So if we go and get the samples from from MySQL, say, within Vivid Cortex, which is another one of our, our products, um, you can actually configure it to say, 
if, if the string within the literal matches a certain profile, like let's say a, a social security number or something like that um, pattern match, you can exclude it from the sample. So we strip it out. So depending on you know, what you guys define as sensitive or you know, PII type information, yeah, there's ways to, to get around that. Ooh, now we get into new tables. Yay. So event statements histo eh, histogram by digest. So we have a new table called histogram by digest. I'm excluding the other part just because it's so long. Uh, but it contains per digest groups of, of latency bands and query counts. So it's actually more granular than, remember, our 95, 99, and 999. So it gets, gets better than that. Um, it's, it is a new table, but it's doing a lot of aggregation for us. So that's the cool part of this. So thank you, Performance Schema. Um, I'll let you guys kind of read through that a little bit. But, but really, at a high level, if you, if you look at the example that I threw in there, and this is one that I created like just before this, but um, this is just an example of a histogram. right? It's like, what events am I looking for? How do I define those events? And then how many counts for each of those events do I observe over time? Right? So where does it fall in? So the advantage here is that, well, for me anyway, and hopefully for you, it's, it's a very simple, easy way to kind of consume the data to understand the distribution of those events within your environment. So you know, if this were, I don't know, I didn't put labels on the axes or anything like that. But if this were seconds to execute for a query, number one, I'd probably do a range like 0 to 1, you know, 1 to 2, something like that. But, but let's assume that I did that and wasn't lazy. Um, you can see that I had 25 executions of a query that took 7 seconds, right? I also had, what was it, 5 executions that took 1 second. So the nice thing is, is when I plot it out like this, I really get a good understanding of the distribution. You know, is it more like a bell curve pattern? Do I have like a high side and a low side? Because it's fairly, uh, I don't know what, bifurcated or something. I don't know. I'm just making up words now. Um, is there a grouping of data? Do they tend to center around, you know, a, 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 like between six and seven seconds seems to be like the most executions. So it just provides a lot of IQ for us about the workload that we're seeing from a digested query. Cool. So these histograms become pretty cool. Um, I like this view of it, although here when we start to get into some of the, some of the things we can get out of, of MySQL just from like command line, you'll see that we get pretty much the same data, just formatted a little bit uh, less readable. To me, anyway. Uh, here's an example of a bucket and what it contains. So this would be like the value of seven seconds on my other histogram chart. So a couple things to call out. There is a timer low and a timer high for the bucket, right? This this defines the range or what I want to fall into this bucket. So if the execution is what does that evaluate out to? Like, whatever, 66 million picoseconds, right? Then I want it to, or over that, I want it to fall into this bucket. But put it in the next bucket if it's over 69 million picoseconds. Um, is that the configurable? You can define what are the latency or the packet sizes, uh, how, what are the thresholds for to remove from one to the other, or is it yes? Let's connect afterwards. Again, great question for Andrew. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, good question. Because is it is is the performance schema kind of in in just so everybody else hears this? Um, the question was basically does does micro or the uh, the MySQL performance schema kind of kind of determine its own buckets based on you know some kind of percentile or something like that or some kind of you know how does it determine the buckets or can I do that in a manual fashion? Can I define like what do I want to capture within buckets? 
don't don't know that one. I'm suspecting that's done by the performance schema, but I don't know that for sure. So great question. You get a hat, by the way. I'll, I can't. Remind me. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted to call out, and, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, actually, but we've also got a count bucket and a count and lower bucket as well. So, and again, I'll get to that in this slide. So if everybody's kind of consumed this, again, you guys will get a, the recording or a copy of the slides. Um, so now we've got the histogram by, by digest and, and, and a couple more things to, to note here. So the digest is the, the same digest hash value as from the, the other summary table, right? Summary by digest. So the nice thing here is that now we have an easy way to go ahead and do the join on these guys. Um, bucket timers capture low and high execution durations. Again, I stated that's in PyCos. It's like, it's like 10 to the minus 12th or something like that. Like wait, the precision gets pretty good, right? I don't, I don't know if I need more than that personally. Um, so the cool thing here is that you can see the executions that fall within these values, um, but also fall within these values or less than these values. So I can tell you what fell into the seven bucket within my histogram, but I can also tell you what fell into the seven and lower bucket as well, like an aggregation of all of those. So it's pretty cool to say like, okay, now I can start to get a much better idea and more intelligent about what percentage of my workload actually falls within an SLA. And let's say, look natural, look natural. Let's say that um, the, God, where was I? So, oh, yeah, let's say my SLA were eight or under, right? Now I have a really good way to say what percentage of my workload is actually meeting the SLA or SLO targets versus what falls outside of that. OK. And then we also have this, oh, maybe this speaks to it. We've got this bucket quantile and percentage of executions into this bucket or lower. Yeah, let's see. It doesn't say how it's determined, though, yet. So I'm, I'm still not, not sure on that question. So let's put a pin in that one. Uh, here's an example of querying the histogram by digest table and putting it in a little nicer format using like an order by. Um, but but looks pretty cool because now I can start to see um, the distribution of my queries that meet or exceed a certain threshold via, 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 whatever you say. Um, kind of an ever tightening SLO, right? Or, or, or time to execute, to complete that execution. So you can see here it's divided up by, by you know, 10 quantiles, I guess, 10% quantiles. Um, but you can see as, as I get tighter and tighter in my time frames or my, my tolerance of how long this thing can take to execute, uh, less and less of my workload actually satisfies that, actually is successfully doing that. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, Andrew did a limit of 10, and I was noticing this because I was like, well, where does it start then? Like, where's my high water mark? Because here we only start at 100 milliseconds, and then we go down. But note that a little more than 13% of our workload is actually above that 100 milliseconds. So this is one of those cases where just out of curiosity, like, well, was it? 150 milliseconds, was that my high water mark, or where was that, right? But the information's there, the data's there. It's just that he limited it to the, the first 10. Okay. Histogram graphs, here's, here's another one. So this is the uh, average latency histogram table. And again, if we query this one, and this is what I kind of referenced earlier, too. This gives us the same information as that histogram as I laid it out just within the, the visual chart. Um, it just represented a little bit different where, like, the, 
the, the splats or the stars equal two units. So you have to do two counts for every one of those. A dash is like one unit. Um, for me, this is definitely a little, little tougher to read than, hey, this bar is huge and this bar is, you know, they're the same increments basically. Now I have to do mental math to figure this out a little bit. But again, the data is there. So that's the cool part. Need the data first. Um, including off the chart. So this one didn't have any limitations as to what I was pulling back. This one actually had one execution that was way down under like 30, what was it, 3,500 milliseconds or something like that. So this one will give you that high watermark. And again, I'm kind of looking at this like, where am I tending to cluster around statistically? Uh, where are my outliers? Is this a, you know, do I have a whole bunch of executions that are just above my SLA? Or do I have one execution that was huge in duration that's outside? So that one's an outlier, right? It's a, an anomaly, basically. OK, what to do with this data? Um, so here we have suboptimal average latencies. So some common causes, kind of chatted or touched on this a little bit, missing indexes data type conversions, um, functions in the where clause, even data model inefficiencies. These things can all uh, kind of push things into suboptimal average latency for queries. The next one, we're talking about inefficient data access. So again, the order of magnitude or the, the magnitude of the rows being examined versus returned. So here again, I'm doing way too much work I'm having to read like, like 50 newspapers to find the two articles that I really cared about. Like as a person, you're not going to do that. Yet sometimes this is exactly what we're asking the MySQL engine to do. And causes for that, I'll reference back to point one. Uh, generate a significant number of warnings or errors. This can cause an interruption to service. A lot of times we'll have retry logic, we'll have, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it's a good way to identify what I would call like a, a general purpose catch-all for inefficient data access, regardless of the reason, right? Now, as a data professional, as a tuning expert, we're going to go look for that reason. Is it a missing index? Is it an implicit data type conversion because now the index is thrown out because the optimizer can't use it, right? Yeah, ex exactly. So regardless of the reason, it's a good catch-all for things that you should be inspecting. OK. Uh, again, errors, interruption to service. We may have retry logic, but you know those errors really affect our, our end users sometimes from performance, or they just can't get the data. Uh, create a significant amount of temporary data. So generally speaking, we're talking about a lot of I.O. that, that we're going to incur based on, on writing that data to our, our temporary database. Um, again, just inefficiencies that get built into the system that we want to watch for. Are executing inefficiently, so like a sum, select, full, join, those kind of things. Um, are we joining via the primary key, foreign key, things like that. Um, and then things like large sort buffers that, or, or, or that sort operations that could benefit from a larger sort buffer uh, construct within cache. So in other words, are we doing a lot of order buys or min max or those kind of function calls or, or kind of sorting things that cause us to leverage that memory space? And, and by the way, if we, don't, if we can't fit the data set within that sort operation uh, buffer, then that spills over to disk. Of course, right? So, got to watch for that. Um, we already covered the the CPU thing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip on that. If anybody has any questions, come see me afterwards. But uh, really, the, the 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 cool thing is for the sample query text, and I think I, I touched on this also. The literals can make a big difference on how the optimizer sees this thing, and parses it and determines the access path. 
So depending on what those literals are, then you know it, it's good to know that in case we see wide variations within our response times to understand, like, could that be part of the cause? All right, and this is just a, this is honestly just more of a mathematical exercise, like what to do with some of these SLOs that, again, if we're more intelligent about it, we're going to be meeting the business requirements or being able to prove empirically that we're doing things to improve and get closer to what those business requirements are. Um, I'm personally glad to see SLOs. I don't like to see SLAs. You guys know the difference? SLO is like, I'll try. SLA means thou shalt, right? Like, there are repercussions from an SLA. SLO is best effort. Um, having said that, I'm not saying ignore them. That's not a good idea either. But, but here we have the, the bucket timer high and the, buff, you know, the, the, the two use cases that we saw earlier. 95% of the requests in less than 450 milliseconds, and then you know, 99% of the requests less than 900 milliseconds. These are two different SLOs. Um, you can see that we hit the one, the less than 450 milliseconds for 95% of the workload for this digest. We missed the other one, right? So that's the one to focus on. Like, how do we, how do we get the 99% the, uh, of the workload to execute in less than 900 milliseconds? What to do? Great example on leveraging the information within these tables. Um, I'll, again, kind of kind of let you guys read through this, but uh, we really want to focus on those outliers and see what we can do to get those, bring those back in. But, but also, here's another key point. Um, what's the distribution of the workload outside of our SLO, right? So is it just one huge execution that took forever that's, you know, that should really be thrown away as a data point? versus, hey, there's a whole bunch of workload that's actually executing outside of our SLO, and I need to, this is more of a systemic problem. So understanding those histograms really comes into play here, can really help you mathematically get to the right solution for this. Perfect, I'll be done in one. <laughs> so just to recap, uh, use the performance schema data about the workload, great way to achieve you know, just a higher intelligence IQ about your own workload, um, how good the system is today, where are my best opportunities for tuning and optimizing, like where do I invest my efforts, where's my highest ROI, right? A uh, great way to capture new workload from maybe new application releases, things like that, um, understanding workload before and after certain changes, like upgrades from either the software the hardware, again, new code pushes, something just gets promoted to production. Um, having that before and after is fantastic. And then, again, being able to empirically deliver on the SLO promises you've been tasked with, right, to show the good work that you guys have been doing. OK, this is from Andrew, his sign off. That is the index finger. <laughs> Again, if you like the presentation, my name, no, just kidding. Um, questions in the last less than two minutes. And, and you guys were great about asking them during the presentation as well, so. This is okay. A I don't have a question, but, uh, but <laughs> someone asked about, like, uh, I think it was you, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, you asked about, like, making sure that digest information or query text doesn't become available to oh, sensitive so data. Just don't grant the user <clears throat> that you're worried about to have any permissions and they get the performance schema and that's done, right? Like well, because if you go to the moment I actually access the performance schema so they should actually use those as the But you could omit that table, right? Like you could just omit that from the grants that you you grant. It's just an idea for you so in case you actually give access Right. Just a thought. Yeah. You can do it at the grant level too. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but I see your point now. 
Yep. I wonder if there's a way to obfuscate that data too once it's captured. That would be a hell of a. The metadata about the performance, not the actual literals. Yep. Cool, guys. Well, at that point, thank you all. On behalf of Andrew, thank you. <laughs>